Hi, we're the Duncans. Forrest is a full-time row crop farmer in Deckard, Tennessee. And Anna is an extension agent in Coffee County. And today, we would like to give you a small tour of our farm and show you how the corn and soybeans that we grow here end up in the products that you use every day. Welcome to our farm. I'm a fifth generation farmer. On our farm, we farm about 2,500 acres. We grow corn and soybeans. And you may not realize it, but these crops are made into a lot of everyday products that you wouldn't think about them being in. It all starts in the spring when we plant our crops. After you plant your crops in about seven to 10 days, they start popping out of the ground and they continue to grow all summer until fall comes. In the fall, we use the combine to harvest our crops. The combine, as it's going through the field, separates the grain from the trash. As the when the combine gets full, the tractor pulls the grain cart under the combine auger and the combine dumps the grain onto the grain cart, which then takes the grain to the side of the road where the tractor trailer truck is parked. When you get to the truck, you put the grain from the grain cart onto the truck, which then takes the grain to our grain bins where we unload it and store it. But wait, what's a grain bin? A grain bin is a large metal structure that we store our grain in until it's needed. The grain bin in the picture holds about 60,000 bushel of corn when it's full. So now that you've grown and harvested the corn, what can it be used for? It can be used for livestock feed, fuel for your car, bioplastics or glue, and even chalk. Okay, and what about soybeans? What can they be used for? It can be used for adhesives like glue, ink for your printer, laundry detergent, and even oil. Well, that's pretty neat, Forrest, but I don't think many of those products are made in Deckard, Tennessee, where you grow your corn or your soybeans, right? That's right. We sell our corn and soybeans to our local granary, which ships them to the Port of Memphis, where they use barges to ship our corn and soybeans down the Mississippi River to their final destination. Okay, so without a barge, this whole process would be a lot more difficult, wouldn't it? Yes, it would be. So let's look at what a barge is and maybe make one of our own. All right, so what you'll do is take out about a foot or so of aluminum foil. It doesn't have to be exact. And then use your imagination to build your own barge. You can use the traditional barge shape, like making it long and skinny like this. So like this. Make one like that, or you could even make one that's more rounded, more like a bolt. So maybe you make two or three different barge designs. You can use these designs or one of your own. Okay, so now that you have your barges here in the water, it's time to test them. So you can have, you know, your dried rice or beans, or I'm using popcorn, and I'll just scoop some out and put a spoonful at a time in each barge. And I'll just keep doing this until one of them sinks. And we'll see which one wins. So now you've tested out your barges. Which one lasted the longest? Which one sunk the fastest? Most likely the one that was able to stay afloat the longest was the one that was long and skinny, like a traditional barge. But why is that? 
This is because this design allowed you to spread the weight out across more surface area. And so you had more water underneath the weight to support it. To illustrate this, let's think about a swimming pool on a hot summer day. When you jump off the diving board, would you rather do a cannonball or belly flop? You'd much rather do a cannonball because it won't hurt nearly as bad as a belly flop, right? Because when you do a belly flop, you have so much more surface area that comes in contact with the water. So you have more water supporting you and it stops you from going down in the deep end. But when you do a cannonball, your whole body is scrunched up in one little area so all of your weight is concentrated in one small area of water and that lets you fall right through. There's not enough water to hold you up and stop you from falling like when you belly flop. It's very similar to your barges here. When you have that long and skinny shape, it spreads the weight out so it stops it from sinking because you have more water to support it from underneath. You can also think about this like when you're in the shallow end and if you just lay back and try to float on your own with your arms spread out and your legs spread out, you can float. But if you're standing in the shallow end and you just pull your knees up to your chest, you'll sink. It's the same thing. You're putting all of your weight in one small area and there's not enough water underneath you to support you. So the same principle applies to your barges. Now, if you made a long and skinny barge, but you only put the weight in the very center, it might have lost to your other barge because you only put the weight in one small spot. You didn't spread it out. So these principles of surface area and surface tension and what we call density really affect how engineers design barges and even the grain bins that we looked at earlier.